Hi queens, welcome to another episode of the Body Love Binge. I've got a special guest with me today. I'm actually very excited to speak to Livia because, well, you'll you'll find out why when we dive in. So I'm just going to read her bio to you. So Livia is an autism advocate and eating disorder survivor who now helps others overcome their own mental barriers through her courses, coaching programs, and books. She is the creator behind the blog, livelabelfree.com and the host of the Live Label Free podcast. Livia is a lifelong learner who loves listening to audio books, going on walks, reading the latest science on all things neurodiversity and eating disorders. A woman after my own heart, Lithia. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Victoria. I am just delighted to be here. You are. It's a, it's a pleasure. And before we press record, we were just um, laughing at how the fact that I'm British but live in the Netherlands and you were born in the Netherlands and you're yeah. currently in the Netherlands right now. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're super close to each other and we didn't even we didn't even know it. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. I say your name correctly, don't I? Livia. Yeah, Livia. Yeah. In in Dutch they say Livia. Um Livia. because just random backstory, but when I, I was born two weeks late, um, but I was very small. I was the size of a premature baby and I had to be put in the incubator even though I was oh, two wow. weeks late, which was like the first kind of that's odd. <laughs> Um, Mm -hmm. and later on in therapy, you know, they said that was the cause of my eating disorder and all that bullshit. Um, but I guess we'll never know. Um, but anyways, because I was so small and so leaf, so cute, um, my parents named me Livia. Um, but in, in America where I grew up, um, we say Livia. Um, but yeah, Livia, 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 (laughs) it's all good. (laughs) And do you speak Dutch? I do. I'm, I'm, I'm fluent. Yeah. Oh, I'm kind of envious of that because I haven't purposely learned. So climb beige Netherlands, heal more than I. It's more than most people know. <laughs> Bits and bobs, you know, we'll get there. Yeah. One day I'll get there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so normally I have 10 quick fire questions. However, because I really want to respect you and the autism and the no surprises, I've actually not going to land that on you today. Well, well, actually, go ahead, because I have been listening to your podcast for a while. So I mentally actually prepared myself for the quick fire question. Okay, let's do it. I'm going to make these up completely because I have none in front of me. So let me take the first one. Um, Early bird or night owl? Honestly, it totally depends. It totally depends. In the US, I'm an early bird because I'm in the come from the Dutch time zone. But in Mm -hmm. the Dutch time zone, I tend to be later night owl um and when I was in Bali I was a later bird (laughs) whatever you're saying but when I was in California I was an early bird so um I I'm honestly not one or the other I love that flexibility and just honoring yourself and whatever happens and feels right Right. yeah second one if you could be an animal what animal would you be and why oh gosh um that I don't know why, but for some reason, I've always had something with tigers. <laughs> um, I think I, I always use them in, in my metaphors when I'm talking about, you know, being in a state of stress and how the body doesn't can't differentiate between like a fear food or like being chased by a tiger kind of thing. Um, And I, I think I love tigers because I love cats. I used to have two Siamese cats and tigers with their stripes and just their very unique yet prominent presence um it it just emanates power to me and and a sense of dominance and you know having control <laughs> and i think as, especially as an autistic person um that you know that's i guess what what i strive to have not control but i i think that sense of power and like i know what i'm doing kind of thing and just feeling really confident oh i love yeah. that this is fun making it up on the spot number 3 yeah. What does self-love mean to you in no more than three to five words? Oh, God, three to five words. Um, some, you can yeah. have more, it's fine. I'm just like, um, I'm just help like to be powerful, short, straight to the point. Like what yes, that means um, to you. I think it means having compassion for yourself. Mm, I agree. Number four, your favorite food? Can't pick one, but if I had to strawberry 
Strawberries. Oh, yeah. when they're in season and they're yeah. so ripe, they're delicious. Yes. Yes. Number five, describe yourself in three words. Um, trustworthy, um, passionate and persistent. Love. Number six. Hmm. I've asked these before with different guests, but if you could have dinner with anyone in the world, whether they were dead or alive, who would it be and why? Um, okay, this is going to sound <laughs> kind of weird, um, but with, um, with Franz Kafka, the, the writer, um, because he was autistic and also had anorexia, which is super fascinating to me. Um, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is fascinating. Number seven, oh, obviously feel free to use your own book as well in this, an okay. in this answer. What two books do you recommend people read in, in our space? Um, Number one, the book Asper Girls by Rudy Simone. Um, I discovered I'm autistic through her book. Um, And yeah, number two, Rainbow Girl, my book, my memoir, which is all about the overlap between autism and eating disorders. Yeah, I'm going to get that. I can't wait to read that. And I'm so, like I say, so happy to have you here so I can understand more as well. Well, I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you because I have oh. a whole box behind me and I'm like, I need to get rid of these books. <laughs> Thank you. So, so yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, okay, three questions left. Random that I always I always come with whatever my intuition comes with. What's your favorite flower? Um, I... I think I'd have to say, um, forget me not. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a t-shirt with forget me not. And I mean, it kind of reminds me of lavender too, which always calms me down. So mm -hmm. um, I'd have to say forget me not. Yeah. Love that. I love the name too. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And number nine. Oh, no. Ooh, if you could go forward in the future, 10 years, so how old would you be then? It, it the screen just froze, so I didn't hear your oh, question. That's weird. Um, <laughs> if you could go forward into the future ten years, how old would you be? Then I've got another question. Um, I I wouldn't go into the future. I'm I'm on my path now. <laughs> I don't know if this is an okay answer. Um, but but I think you know, my current philosophy about life is like enjoying every moment and living in the present um yeah because that's the only moment we ever have yeah I love that that's a there's no right answer that's a perfect answer as far as I'm <laughs> concerned and the last question as we just as we go into the main depth of this podcast what would you like people to take away from the conversation we're about to have um yeah I I sent I sent my answer to you and now I totally forget what it was. Um, but, so I'll speak from my intuition here. Um, and that's honestly, you know, that they get a better understanding of the link between autism and eating disorders um, and just really learn. And I think internalize that they're not alone, that they're not broken, um, that their eating disorder was likely and is likely or was likely or whatever, um, a manifestation of of autism and autistic traits um and that there is hope for them to fully recover no matter what they've been told by professionals um because I've been told some pretty nasty things wow I think that is so important and I would love to go into your story now because so many people especially those on the autism spectrum have said have told me that professionals have said you know because of this condition you might not be able to fully recover and I don't believe that at all. I know that everyone can recover, but speaking from your own experience with autism, can you share with us how you got to where you are today and a bit about your story with your eating disorder and autism? Yeah, so um, thank you for asking that and for making the space for me to share my story because um, I, I tru truly believe in stories of, of lived experience, um, like your own, of course. Um, yeah, so kind of growing up, I... I always knew that there was something different about me. Um, I, I didn't know I was autistic. I mean, my parents didn't know what autism was. I think so many people associate, have this like stigmatizing image of what autism is. Like the movie Rain Man and there were more Netflix shows coming out with like autistic 
guys um like uh what what's that show there's something oh, i totally i'm blanking on the name but the good doctor we have you know um the typical autism is can't be social you know is super smart um just says the wrong things at the wrong times um that's kind of the image that's portrayed in of autism um and of course in school you're not you're not taught what is autism um and if you are you're kind of presented with the stereotype similar to eating disorders like I remember learning about eating disorders when I was in fifth grade and it was like there's anorexia there's bulimia and there's binge eating disorder there's nothing else um and just really of course the stereotypical stereotypical definitions um which I never resonated with um but yeah kind of growing up I I knew that there was something different about me um I was never interested in kind of the girly girly things that my classmates liked I didn't like playing with dolls I didn't like makeup I didn't like clothes shopping I I had most of my friends were actually boys um and I would you know as the only girl go outside and play soccer with the boys um I always wanted the activity to have some sort of purpose behind it um so I also never gossiped or talked behind people's backs um because that just did not feel right to me there was no justice there um I always had this really strong sense of righteousness um I was able to talk very easily to adults so I would be five six seven eight years old and I could just have a conversation with my parents friends (laughs) and they would be like wow she's so mature she's so wise beyond her years um but but anyways kind of fast forwarding to when when I was in fifth grade, when I was 11 years old, um, we started learning about health and nutrition in school. Um, and that's kind of when I'd say my eating disorder started. Um, it's, I just took everything, all the advice, all the recommendations so literally, um, and just the information about health and what you needed to do to be healthy it became this really intense interest of mine and I became so immersed in it and so passionate about it um which passion is like a huge autistic asset um but I think it can also be our Achilles heel when it manifests into something that ends up being a disorder um so yeah I developed my eating disorder when I was 11 and eventually diagnosed with anorexia um but yeah all throughout my eating disorder I never resonated with this label anorexia because of the stereotype right I never had body dysmorphia I never believed I was fat or looked fat I never had you know the fear of weight gain or kind of all these typical things that that come with anorexia for me it was really about about that control right that I could um channel my energy and my focus onto this seemingly simple aspect of life um and I think when you're so young you can't turn to you know smoking or drinking or these other kinds of numbing um numbing substances I guess um but we all have to eat we all have to move every day um so it, it kind of channeled into that I'd say um and all this time you know I didn't know I was autistic um and so I I was forced in and out of treatment because of course I was a minor um but every treatment just made everything worse I did not feel understood I did not feel seen the the therapists and the treatment team were, were saying things to me and how I felt and I was like this this isn't it they often you know said I was lying and not being honest because they were like you just you just think you're fat and you're afraid of gaining weight but you just don't want to tell us kind of thing um yeah and then like I was also a very picky eater growing up I only ate this is gonna sound so American um macaroni and cheese chicken nuggets and broccoli that was my dinner every single day until the age of 10 um but then when I developed my eating disorder I I ate, you know, only the clean and only the healthy foods that I learned in school, I had to eat to be healthy, quote unquote healthy. Um, But but yeah, so then throughout treatment, I also just the eating was was a struggle for me, because we weren't allowed to know what we were going to have, you know, until the moment that the meal was being served, which just gave me so much immense anxiety, because a key autistic trait is, you know, we need to know what's happening. We need that predictability. Um, and just all of that, everything that I needed and still need today was just taken from under me and basically said, 
yeah, those are all eating disorder behaviors. If you want to fully recover from your eating disorder, you're basically indirectly going to need to not be autistic, of course. Um, okay. They didn't use the word autism, but basically saying you need to be flexible. You need to be able to be spontaneous, live without structure. You need to, you know, be able to not know things in advance. Like all of my autistic traits, they basically set as like ultimatums for you have to get rid of all of that to be recovered um well of course i mean if you are fighting the individual in treatment rather than discovering who the individual is um it just it just made everything worse i often manipulated you know i water loaded just to you know make the scale go up while i was hiding food um i was doing secret exercise um and it's funny because all of these behaviors although of course eating disorder behaviors for me, they they weren't even necessarily about, you know, uh, feeding, no pun intended, feeding my eating disorder. I would secretly exercise just because someone told me you're not allowed to exercise. Um, I would hide food just because they said you have to eat this. Um, they were taking away my autonomy. And because freedom, autonomy is the most important human <laughs> need yeah. and desire um i was like you can't take my autonomy um of course to my own detriment um but yeah after five almost five years of you know going in and out of treatment constantly being told like she can't be helped she's too rebellious she's too manipulative when i was 15 and i was actually in a clinic in the netherlands in zeist um Rinsfeld, you maybe know it yeah. um which is another side tangent but almost all of my all of my fellow patients are now no longer with us um which is just wow. absolutely like I have no words um but I walked home in the middle of the night when I was impatient there um because I had I had to show my parents like look you cannot lock me up in here I'm just gonna get sicker if you keep me here I walked all the way home in the middle of the night um and this whole story is also in my book um the next day I, I went back to the clinic for the serious talk we had to have and that's when the the clinical director there told me you're just going to have to accept the fact that you're never going to get better um and yeah as you've said um I think so many people are, are told this especially autistic people because professionals they don't know what's going on they don't know why they don't know why is this person quote-unquote non-compliant right um and yeah, after that, things things got really bad. I was having panic attacks every single day. I think that the root of there was the the autism. But on the other hand, you know, a malnourished brain cannot cannot think anymore. We, I would have an outburst if my mom didn't perfectly count my almonds. Like things that looking back now, I'm like, I I cannot believe I reacted in that way. Um. But, but yeah, we react so primally when we are malnourished that I just had panic attacks every single day. Um, though I do believe that it was the panic attacks, actually, that, that led me to realize I can't keep living this way anymore because it was this one night I had been having panic attacks for months. My sisters were trembling in the corner. They were, they were absolutely terrified of me i i hit my mom i gave my family bruises you know just the most awful things um and when i saw when i noticed you know this isn't just affecting me anymore this is affecting everyone around me i i said you know i i can't do this anymore i have to recover i have to get better um and that rock bottom moment was kind of the night that i said you know it can only go up from here um that's when i fully committed to recovery um, and as much as I wish I could say, like, everything was, like, beautiful after that, and I gained weight, and I ate, and I, uh, I overcame my fear foods, and only in the process, I discovered I'm autistic, and now my life is perfect, um, it was, it was a long, very hard, difficult struggle, um, because of all the bodily changes, you know, that, that come w with recovery, first of all, I had never gone through puberty before because I was 11 when I developed my eating disorder, got my first period when I was almost 19. Um, and all these things felt so foreign to me. And I think especially when you're autistic and a part of my eating disorder was so I could stay young, could stay small, could, you know, avoid responsibilities that come with adulthood. This, this was really difficult for me. Um, but I think what motivated me throughout all of it you know was this belief that how I was living before with the eating disorder that 
was guaranteed misery. I mean, I didn't know what was going to come, what the future would hold. I still don't know what the future holds. Um, But I think that life is always going to be better than a life in which you keep yourself small. <laughs> um because there's no discovery when you when your world is small um so yeah kind of fast forward to 2020 during the covid pandemic um i was still living at home at the time finishing school um but because everyone was suddenly home the whole family was suddenly home i just constantly felt myself being very overstimulated and for the first time since being recovered from my eating disorder which was 2018 2019 i i felt really pulled back to you know counting calories obsessive exercise like all these eating disorder behaviors that helped me cope throughout my childhood I I felt pulled back to them and I was like this is so weird because I don't want the eating disorder but I want these behaviors (laughs) like what's going on here um and this yeah this story is explained in my book kind of how I discovered I'm autistic too um but I had started my coaching program, my one-on-one coaching program, and my first client was actually autistic. And she was telling me about her life and how she resonated with my story about being told she was too complex. And then I was like, this is so interesting because you're basically describing me. Um, And that's when I read the book Asperger's because my mom had bought that book like five years before um, because one of her friends had suggested it, but my mom had like so many help your child with an eating disorder books that she she was overwhelmed to and I don't think she read any of them um but I I read that book and I've never read a book that fast in my entire life because I just felt so seen felt so validated felt so understood um and I think that moment for me allowed me to go to go from like recovered but like also still feeling like the eating disorder was kind of a, a thing to wow, I'm just me. And these behaviors, um, I guess these preferences around food and structure and and routine can exist completely separate from an eating disorder. Because I think ultimately, the only thing that defines an eating disorder and eating disorder behaviors is the intention behind the behaviors, right? Um, I mean, someone can order a salad because they're not that hungry and they really want a salad, or they can order a salad because it's like, I need to find the lowest calorie option um, because of the eating disorder. So, um, yeah, and I mean, I, I could honestly go on for hours, um, and this is why I wrote an entire book, um, but I'm, I'm going to kind of halt myself there um, in, in saying kind of that's my eating disorder recovery journey, um, my autism discovery journey. And yeah, now, years later, um, I specifically, you know, work with people and educate also parents on um, – what is the overlap? What is the link between autism and eating disorders? And how can it, an understanding of that link help you to actually use your autistic traits to your advantage to recover rather than seeing them as this is going to make recovery harder or even, dare say, impossible, what many of them professionals say? Wow. Okay. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you so much, Lithia, for sharing that your story so beautifully and I would love for you to go into what you just spoke to in a moment but I have a question that I've been reflecting on as you've shared so what I heard was every time you were in inpatient treatment yeah it was very much and I felt this from my parents when I was in recovery too forcing very clinical no kind of love and openness and and really seeing you and hearing you so would you say what changed for you was when you decided yourself that you wanted to recover yes yes I 100,000% stand behind that I think you know you can't force anyone into recovery if anything the force just creates more resistance I think that's also where you know the tube feeding and the force feeding, the I'm sure you've heard about it, but in the Netherlands, we have all these stories of hospitals binding the patients down to the bed so they can force the, the nutrition, nutri drink into their nose. I mean, all that is so deeply, deeply, deeply traumatizing. Yeah. It creates more resistance to, to eating because the not eating is the coping mechanism, right? So yeah. if you're going to take away the coping mechanism, you're just going to cling harder to the coping mechanism. Um, but anyways, to, to answer your question, yeah, I mean, I think the first step to to recovery from an eating disorder is deciding 
I don't want this life anymore. I want to get better. I want it, not because other people want it, but because I want it. Yeah, cold shiver I just had right there because that is the case. That was the case for me until I decided it. I wanted to do it for me. And like you, I did look at the effect it was having on my family. And I thought, okay, it's not just me involved in this now. It's other people. Right. And I was like, you, I rebelled. I don't know if you're into human design. Do you? Do yeah, you know? I had a human design from uh, Chetan Perkin. Is that his name? Uh, well, what? I have one of the human design books. <laughs> What's your energy type? I read that book like three years ago. It's It went in one year, out the I'm other. I'm curious if you're a manifester. Oh, yes, yes, that's what it was. I am, I am. Of yeah. course you are, because so am I. And you know, the one massive thing with manifestors, we fucking hate being told what to do. Yeah. And if someone tells us what to do, we're going to do the opposite on purpose because nobody <laughs> yeah. tells us what to do. Right. Well, then I think that almost like all autistic people are manifestors too, because we need, and I think that's kind of what I said in the beginning of the episode with the tiger, how we like to have power. We like to be in control. We like to create our own circumstances. Yes. And I think, you know, that's why you and me are such excellent entrepreneurs as well. I always joke with people, if I have to work a nine to five, I'm going to be fired after five minutes because <laughs> because they're going to tell me what to do. And I'm like, well, now I'm going to do the opposite of what you told me. <laughs> they're going to fire me. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God, Livia, that is so true. And that is so exciting. And I'll be so interested to know, like, as you go along helping your, your people, please let me know how many percentage of the people that you help with autism are indeed manifestors. Oh, okay. I'm going to like have to add this to my, to my coaching. It's like, we're going to yeah. just have one session. It's going to be called human design. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's just, okay. I love wow, that. Fascinating to me. So I was like, you completely rebelling against everything. So it needs to come from you, the decision to want to get better. Now yeah. I would love to go into, let me just look at the notes. Yes. The autistic traits in general. Yeah. My husband actually is autistic as well. Well, that's why you guys are married, Victoria. <laughs> There you go. That's why we click so well. Exactly. It's, but yeah. it, it's been so helpful to me, Livia, to understand <sighs> him and not just because when I first obviously met him and I'd be like, can you help me to understand like why you need like four weeks to go to the seaside when I'm like, can we go tomorrow? And it's really helped me for him to explain how what goes on in his head and how he feels. And we're so polar opposite. So in our human design, it's so interesting. What I have, he doesn't have. And what he doesn't have, I have. So we just fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. It's, that's, <laughs> um, honestly, I'm like, I do not cry quickly, but <laughs> I'm getting so emotional right now because Victoria, I ever since we turned the camera on, I just feel this super strong connection to you um oh my god I don't even okay this is like if my family were here they'd be like Livia you never fucking cry why are you... oh it's my god um, I'm so grateful that you feel the love that I'm giving you Livia and I see you yeah. I really see you and I I feel that I feel that um and I think that's kind of what we were talking about with the energy with the crystals too it's like it's, you can't put words to it. You can't make it tangible, but you know it's there. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's that feeling, I think, that I had all throughout my eating disorder recovery. I was like, there's something there that no one is seeing, that no one understands, but I know there's something there. And, it, and also, this sounds crazy, but I think one of the reasons why I was able to sustain my eating disorder for so long was because there was always something inside of me that was like, I know I'm going to get better from this. <laughs> like, I know this is going to end at some point, but yeah. because I knew it was going to end, I was like, well, then I'll just keep going <laughs> until yes, it ends. I resonate so yeah. much with yeah. that. I mean, I'm not autistic, but for some reason I resonate deeply with that. Yeah. That is insane. So I would love for you to go into how can autistic traits manifest as an eating disorder traits and then how do you, of course, the big question is, how did you, I know it was a choice, which is everything, the decision to recover. How did you use your autistic traits to support you in recovery? I yeah. love to hear all of this. Yeah. So because I, because you just give the beautiful example of your husband by the seaside, <laughs> um, <laughs> the predictability piece, right? I, I would say all autistic people just need to know what's going to happen ahead of time. Um, we can't do things spontaneous. We can't do things last minute. Um, is, can you still hear me? Yeah. 
Okay, because I heard like a, a blip. Um, so yeah, so I think, you know, that that need for predictability, knowing exactly what's going to happen, you know, needing structure so we can plan everything out. Um, that I mean, if you mix that with exercise and food, you get the perfect recipe for an eating disorder. Um, because you get so stuck in, I need to know exactly what I'm going to eat next. I like everything has to be eaten at a certain time and certain amounts. Um, that it just gets so rigid and we have so much fear that if things go differently, we don't, we're so afraid of, of that unpredictable, unpredictability that it's just easier to, you know, have everything always be the same. Um, and when you mix that, you know, with a uh, special interest, being super passionate about a certain subject. So in my case, it was like being healthy and eating very clean. Um, for some of my clients, it's been like they just became obsessed with always being on a diet. Like that became their identity. They didn't know who they were if, if they didn't have this obsessive, like, my, like, they felt their purpose was, you know, diet and to restrict. And that's, of course, the epitome of, of anorexia, of an eating disorder, is just, I feel like my only sole purpose on this planet is to have my eating disorder. I think that's also why recovery then becomes so difficult, is because we, we behave and we act in alignment with our identity. So if you ident identify as an eating disorder, like how can you ever expect to recover, right? Um, yeah. So yeah, the need for predictability and routine is a huge autistic trait. Um, I think also um, the eating disorder is, is a, a form of masking. So for anyone who doesn't know, like masking is kind of trying to come across in society as not autistic trying to come across as normal yeah. um and i think you know when you've when you've been conditioned or you've conditioned yourself you know that and you know you're not normal you know you're different um the eating disorder shields you from from being your true self from being your true often perceived weird self because it keeps you small and i think a huge part I alluded to this earlier, a huge part for me of my eating disorder was this fear that if I was healthy, like actually healthy, not my idea of healthy, if I didn't have the eating disorder anymore, um, that it was like I wouldn't be able to handle the responsibilities that come with that, you know, because um, when I was in school and I obviously hated the panic attacks, but when I had a panic attack, it was very clear, like, oh, she can't go to school. So it was like an excuse from the deadline. And it was an excuse from, from doing the work kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I also had this fear of like, because we all always kind of had money struggles at home. I had this fear that, you know, if um, I was healthy and I was better and I became an adult, like I wouldn't be able to, you know, sustain my life and support myself. Um, so, so that um, the eating disorder is a mask, and I think another another big trait among autistic people. I'm curious if your husband has this as well, but we struggle with like recognizing our internal cues. So whether we're like hungry or thirsty, or whether we are like have to go to the bathroom or not, um, which is called interoceptive awareness. Autistic people tend to really struggle with that. Um, so yeah, for me, I just growing up and and. I mean, I don't really know when people say, oh, I feel so hungry. My stomach is growling. My stomach feels empty. I, I don't really recognize that or resonate with that feeling. Like for me, hunger is almost always mental hunger. <laughs> like that's how I know that I'm hungry. If I'm if I'm obsessively thinking about food or not even obsessively, but just like when I'm reading and I can't really concentrate because I'm like, oh, like what time is lunch or whatever. That's how I know I'm hungry. And I think a huge part of that of course because we live in a society with diet culture and there's so many labels around oh if you're thinking about food it's emotional eating or you're trying to fill a, a deep fucking hole. glass of water or whatever right it is right exactly um that i had a that was a, a really difficult thing for me in recovery was ad accepting and, and permitting myself that my hunger is different and um mm. and and i have to honor that you know if i truly want to be healthy um but that all immediately transitions into the second part of the question was like, how did how did understanding my autistic traits, you know, help me to fully recover? Um, and that was because they gave me permission to be different and be unique and and almost embark on that recovery journey in a different way than 
I was told or kind of I believed like that's the only way to recover kind of thing. Um, and I mean, yeah, I, I could go into like all the traits. Um, I, I think one of them that I do think is an interesting one to go in is the the autistic attachment to numbers. I mean, for me, my whole eating disorder, counting calories, like counting reps, you know, I, if I did this many push ups one day, I had to do that many the next day didn't matter how I felt. Um, and because of that difficulty with interoception, I think autistic people are really easily able to override their internal signals. <laughs> um, so I mean, I was exhausted throughout my entire eating disorder. But of course, because you're in this constant state of hyper fight or flight mode, like you don't know you're tired until you start eating until you start resting. And then suddenly you sleep in 14 hours a day. Yeah. And you're like, what the hell? Yeah. Um, when I had an eating disorder, I was fine. I could go on and on right. and on and on. And then it's not right. you stop. Yeah. yeah. And then that's the ironic part in recovery is you like, did I do everything wrong? Like, like I'm I'm not actually sick enough. Like it was way better doing the eating disorder because I actually had energy then. Yes. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I'd say like going back to the number attachment, I think for me, um, I had this obsessive relationship, not necessarily with like the body skill, but with the food skill. Like I weighed my carrots to the gram. I mm -hmm. cut off like little tiny pieces of bread just so it would weigh exactly, you know, the bread slice serving on the pack, yeah. whatever. Um, and that's kind of where, you know, the the um perfectionism comes in and everything needing to make sense and this kind of stuff. Um, and during my recovery, I, I was told, like, and most of the recovery coaches, um, I'm not going to name names here, said, like, you have to throw out the scale, you have to, like, um, stop counting calories, like, everything numbers related, all the OCD, ED behaviors have to go out the window, um, but I think many of these OCD, ED behaviors can often be autistic traits, and I think if someone does not understand that distinction, that can be super actually damaging and harmful, because, OCD, ED, you have to get rid of it. But if it's yeah. actually an autistic trait that you can't get rid of because being autistic is an identity trait, um, it can be really harmful because it means you, you're fighting the autism. Um, so yeah, for me, like saying like, oh, counting calories is actually motivating me to actually eat a lot more. Right. That actually helped me massively in recovery um, because it helped me to, you know, gradually increase my intake in a way that I still felt in control quote unquote mm. obviously um and now of course i don't count calories anymore i don't weigh my food because i don't need that external validation anymore to feel safe i feel safe now as i am because i am fully recovered um but i think when you are in that place of you like you really don't feel safe because that's what the eating disorder provided you i think a huge part of recovery is where can you incorporate those safety anchors that you know make this whole process of of eating and resting just a little bit more easier just a little bit you know easier to grasp almost and and numbers give us that tangible certainty they give us something to hold on to when it seems like there's nothing to hold on to and we're like in the middle of the ocean and we're just drowning <laughs> Yeah, yeah. what well, that is so interesting and so helpful because it wasn't until I did an episode maybe six months ago now, you may or may not have listened. Uh -huh. It was about autism and eating disorders because I had someone in my DMs asking me how someone herself had autism, that they can't just go all in. So yes. what can they do? And I didn't know. So I researched autism and obviously asked my husband and learned about it. And I did an episode and I made it very clear that I was speaking from what I just learned and speaking uh -huh. from a Victoria way of sharing, not yeah. in my experience. And it was a lot of um, asking, like you've said, bringing what makes you feel safe mm -hmm. into recovery and perhaps not yeah. going all in and mm -hmm. having more of a structure and then gradually introducing fear foods, not all of a sudden just... Yeah. off you go going all in so was that your experience with so did you go all in or did you have to do it separately yeah that's funny because I did a, a podcast episode uh, maybe six months ago as well um or maybe longer and it's the title of the episode is actually called why all in did not work for me <laughs> it was probably um, like the same time that's so crazy yeah. I I know our energies are just aligned to you and yes. if, if we live so close we need to meet up soon 100%, um, and I can I can bring that. you my book and personally give it to you that'll be so fun <laughs> let's do it, let's do it oh, yeah. um but 
oh, there's like an airplane or something really loud. Um, I don't know if you can hear it. I can't hear that, actually. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then the microphone is good. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think all in, you know, that idea indeed, what all in encompasses is basically saying like all the eating disorder behaviors, like you basically have to just turn your life upside down, fully commit to recovery. Um, but But I think kind of the misnomer here is that going all in is not the only way to fully commit to recovery and I think it's become quite trendy and popularized with through social media and YouTube and certain influencers right um but I, but I think the underlying what makes all in so attractive to so many people is not the the label itself I mean that's why I'm all about live label free but it's everything that all in encompasses you know the freedom to stop living by these rules to stop you know restricting yourself all in basically the moment someone says I'm going all in is basically is actually the moment they're saying I'm giving myself permission to honor my body and to actually create this life that I know deep down exists for me I mean whether you want to call that all in whether you want to call that full recovery whether you want to call that I'm going on a discovery journey I mean again the label itself doesn't matter I think what what it's all about is that you are going on this journey for yourself and and in your own unique way um and I think for many autistic people just going all in in the term of like how it's portrayed online just doesn't work because there's no predictability there there's no um like you're not allowed to weigh or measure food like there's so many things that I I feel like unspoken rules around all in um that I feel like just doesn't work for an autistic person um but I mean if we could create like autistic all in but then you could just bring it but then again it's just another label like why don't we just say everyone is going on a, I, li- I just like the term discovery more than anything more than the word recovery because in the end I didn't recover from my eating disorder for the sake of recovery I recovered from my eating disorder so I could discover who I really am mm. and like with all in you're not going all in to go all in you're going all in so that you can live a life that you are like all in the life <laughs> right um yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just really don't like labels very much be- because for that reason, it's not the label you're after, it's it's the outcome that you're after. Um, and I mean, whatever label you take on that helps you get to that outcome, by all means, do your thing. But in the end, I think it's really important to understand what is the core, what is the intention behind this decision of going all in or not. Um, is it so that you'll achieve freedom? Go for it. But if that approach doesn't help you achieve freedom then do something else do your own thing yeah what helped you with using the traits of the autism what helped you I know you've mentioned counting calories was beneficial to you because it gave you safety as you continued to eat more um what else helped you that that would perhaps someone who was only all for all in might look and say oh you need to get rid of that you need to get rid of that like what what else can we can I learn from you with autism recovery um, I think I think um rules can be actually very helpful, but then not even naming them, labeling them as rules, but kind of building in constraints for yourself. Um, because I believe that you know, const- I always this is actually I I believe this is a quote straight from my book, but I always believed that freedom meant living a life without limits. But I've as I've gone on my journey, not only in eating disorder recovery, but also in business and just discovering myself, I've learned that constraints are actually the foundation of creativity because when we have constraints when we have boundaries we have to think within these boundaries you know we can only think outside of the box if there's a box in the first place um and I think this is where you know all in again kind of bringing that back doesn't necessarily work for autistic people because there's no rules like there's no walls it's just like infinite possibilities like that's so overwhelming to us we need an overview we need to see like okay there's option a b c and d and i can pick from these limited options it just gives us a lot more peace of mind um that's where the constraints come in so for me um i kind of used the rules that i had from my eating disorder i kind of flipped them to what how can i adapt to this rule or change this rule to help me live the life i want to live so for example if i had a a rule around you can only eat uh bread at at this meal time and then I would kind of in my mind be like 
how do I want my relationship with bread to be like in the future? I want to be able to eat bread um, at every single time of day. Well, then I'd create this like rule for myself that like um, you have to eat bread at these certain times and just and that kind of helped me desensitize to that there's no limit to bread kind of thing that I could eat bread as much as I wanted I just needed to know when I was going to eat it it needed to be planned basically um or like with exercise like I I was exercising so much so many hours every day and obviously that was not sustainable I mean I had no time for other things so I said you know it's too much for me to say right now go from exercising hours per day to nope now you just have to sit Mm. on the couch all day and eat chips on the couch because that's going all in (laughs) or whatever it is was okay I I know that I need exercise to feel safe but we're gonna cap it we're gonna create a new rule like you can only do 20 minute walk today and and that's it like that's the rule um so I think in this case you know creating rules for yourself creating these boundaries that's how you create your freedom and honestly like today completely separate from eating or food I mean I have boundaries and constraints for myself in my business because I, I'm a workaholic like to, to be honest I feel like most entrepreneurial people are um and that lead what's lead that's what leads us to burnout often um mm. but I mean I say you know even w- I'm recording the audiobook for Rainbow Girl right now if I don't set constraints for that I'm going to feel very overwhelmed. I'm going to procrastinate it because I'm like, I don't know when this is going to start. I don't know when this is going to end. So I have like every day I record that many chapters. If I want to record more, then I have to wait until the next day. I have to keep myself hungry <laughs> kind of thing um, yeah. because that's what keeps it exciting. Um, but I think when we don't have boundaries, we we become overwhelmed by infinite choices. And I think, you know, and then we face de- decision fatigue, which is like, the inability to make good in well-informed choices because there are just too many to make so mm-hmm. so i'd say like creating rules and like limiting your options to something that allows you to continue having an overview in your recovery i think that is what creates safety a lot of the time yeah wow there's so much i want to ask you and i'm kind of looking at my notes and i'm wondering where to go next so i think let's go here so how can parents supporters caregivers best support an autistic individual struggling with an eating disorder because I think that's going to be really beneficial for people to hear yeah so yeah I mean I think that's a great question and it's one of the questions I'm it's most one of your about. questions of course right. it's a great question <laughs> yeah well I think it's most one of the most frequently asked questions is from parents is how can I support my kid how can I support my friend right um and I think kind of going back to those two terms that kept coming up throughout this episode um trust and safety um is you know how is asking almost the individual that you want to support like how how, what do you need to feel safe like how can how can I help you feel safe and really giving them the space to communicate rather than rather than assuming anything. My mom has this quote that I always hate it when she says it, but it's so true. She says, when you assume you make an ass out of you and me. Um, <laughs> and I think that's kind of the danger of, you know, eating this sort of treatment. And as you alluded to with your story, like when the professionals assume what's best or like they force you because they assume we know everything. You're just the sick patient over here. Like, you don't know anything um that's kind of what creates a sense of distrust and safety i mean i never felt safe throughout treatment um because that foundation of any healthy relationship is trust is safety i mean people are vulnerable with each other because they feel safe because they trust that the other person is going to you know hold space for their words um if that's not the foundation of a relationship whether that be a professional patient relationship a parent child relationship if that trust is not there i mean good luck supporting them but you're not going to be able to because the definition of support is you know having foundation <laughs> um yeah. so yeah i'd say you know asking your loved one what they need not making assumptions um and and just not pressuring them or forcing them to do anything because as we discussed it just always has paradoxical effects. Um, and I think um, also viewing 
the the individual as a person like always seeing them as a person rather than a problem or a disorder or something that needs to be fixed i think this is a huge issue in the healthcare system is oh you're coming in this is the anorexic patient well i mean if you're labeling them as this you're giving them that identity and like i said before like how we identify that's who we become that's how we act and therefore it's so important to to um disentangle the eating disorder identity from the person and really have a genuine interest in what are you what are you interests what are your passions you know what do you want and and honestly shifting the focus away from food away from the eating disorder because like like i said before as well where your attention goes energy flows when in recovery that was huge for me it's i when i stopped focusing on recovery and i focused on how do i want to live my life mm-hmm. that's when i was able to fully recover because focusing on recovery that kept me stuck in recovery yeah. um so i definitely say those are kind of some nuggets that people can <laughs> um b- w- yeah take take what they want and leave what they don't massive nuggets thank you lifia and one other question when you're supporting a client I mean perhaps with your business I'm assuming and again we shouldn't assume but I'm gonna right. assume, um or I guess I could ask it in a question do you work primarily with autistic people yes yes it's definitely evolved over time um but I think because of my energy and the way I speak and especially because I mean, my content now has viewed so much toward that overlap. I think I've just attracted (laughs) autistic clients, um, but also a lot of um, ADHD clients as well um, Mm -hmm. that aren't necessarily autistic, but a lot of them have similar struggles. Um, And yeah, kind of, I mean, you are a very unique case here because it is very rare that I resonate so deeply on an energetic level with a non-autistic person. Um, But I mean... I really have that with you. And and that's why I think you're married to your husband because you have this gift to, to have this shared energy between the autistic person. So (laughs) I think that's really magical. Um, but I also do work with a lot of parents of autistic children that aren't necessarily autistic themselves. Um, but I mean, through my, through sharing my experience and my advice, they're able to understand their, their kid better. Um, so yeah, I mean, I work with everyone on his, uh, honestly obviously um I have no rules no restrictions um but I do mostly work with with neurodivergent people thank you I receive what you said by the way thank you and with with someone like myself or other professionals that might be listening or a parent that might be listening and they don't have a child or a patient that is have you got a couple of minutes by the way because I'm looking at the time and I want to be of course yeah yeah okay great so there they haven't been diagnosed at all Mm -hmm. But perhaps through listening to this conversation, they've thought, oh, I am I wonder if this person might be autistic. We don't like labels. Right. Is it helpful, though, for the person to suggest someone gets to be tested or however it works? Do you think that's helpful? Um, Not, not necessarily the testing or the, the diagnosis. I mean, I think if you feel this energetic pull, like I really want a diagnosis or an official slip of paper that says you're autistic, mm. by all means. But I, I don't think that that has to be an ultimatum. I honestly, truly believe that self-diagnosing as an autistic person is is one of the best things you can do in many cases, even the preferable option over official diagnosis, because the diagnosis process can be overstimulating it can be long it can be tiresome it can be unpredictable basically an autistic person's worst nightmare on top of that a lot of invalidation and gaslighting still happens especially among females um and members of the lgbtq community is mm-hmm. like well um I, I mean i've heard so many stories of people going to get an autism assessment they're clearly 100% autistic and they'll go to the autism assessment, but then they'll mask and they'll make eye contact. And the first thing the the uh, professional will say is, oh, you can't be autistic. You make eye contact. So it's like, you know, they've spent all this money on a professional assessment, not to mention energy and anxiety costs that come with that, only to be told they're not really autistic. That leads to them feeling like they're an imposter. Um, so honestly, my recommendation is read um, and listen to people that are autistic. Listen to their stories. Um, read stories of lived experience. And if you 
know or believe you're autistic, you're going to resonate with uh, with what they're saying. Um, I mean, even if people are nodding their head or resonating with my story, like, I'm I'm going to go out and say 95% you're probably autistic, <laughs> honestly, yeah. um, because I think deep in our heart, we know the truth, but, mm-hmm. but society has conditioned us that you can't trust your instincts. Like you, we, we need to follow the rules here. Um, but I think when we give ourselves permission, like you're allowed, your intuition is, I mean, my intuition is always on, spot on, always. Um, and I think once I gave myself that permission to trust that intuition, that that was part of me, you know, having this confidence and moving into uncomfortable situations because I trusted myself I can do this thing um so that's what I'd say is like self-diagnosis more than valid read and educate yourself or on behalf of the person you believe is autistic and I think in in your heart you'll know yeah I think I have one last question if you have time and I maybe you've kind of answered it with what you've said actually and maybe you can or cannot answer this I'm not sure I'm going to ask it anyway how do you think someone with an eating disorder whether they've been di- probably not been diagnosed and they're, they're wondering if they're autistic or not, how can they know whether the eating disorder rule is all born from eating disorder OCD mm-hmm. over an autism trait that they can use to support their recovery? Does that make sense? How do Absolutely. They know the yeah, no, that's a really good question. Also, I, I did a podcast episode actually a while back with this exact title. It's titled... ED behavior or autistic trait? How to oh, tell brilliant. the difference? Can you send me the links? Yeah. I can pop it below. Yeah, to I'll send it well, to you. So. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, to quickly summarize, I think it all comes down to intention. What's the intention behind the behavior? Um, I mentioned it with the salad example, like OCD, eating disorder. It's usually the intention behind the behavior is coming from a place of fear. Um, I'm afraid of a certain outcome. I'm afraid of a certain consequence. I'm afraid I'll lose control, any of these things. Um, but when we are coming from a place of love, then it's most likely an autistic trait. So for, so for me, for example, like let's go back to the example of weighing my food and counting calories in recovery. Um, it, it came from a place of I know I need to eat more. I know I need to nourish my body. And that's why, you know, setting this higher calorie limit, which is difficult for me, but it's a number that I can attach to that's coming up from a place of love for myself because I know that having this um, number is going to basically invite me because I don't want to say force, invite me to eat more. And and inviting myself to eat more is coming from a place of love and compassion for my body. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say it, it all comes down to intention. Oh, love that. Love or fear. That's what everything is born from, either love or fear. Yes. Yes. Wow. Lithia, how can people work with you? Do you accept one-to-one clients? Do you have groups? Like, how can people come into your world? Yeah, I I do only one-to-one coaching at the moment. I think a group program is... People have suggested it, but I think especially with the autistic clientele, I hated anything in groups so I'm like why would I even create that my husband does too yeah. he hates right. groups completely right. he's yeah. like absolutely not right and that's why group therapy was just awful <laughs> um so yeah, yeah I, I work one-to-one at the moment with um people you know who are autistic or not or just struggling with an eating disorder or just want to improve their relationship with food and their life as well as parents um they can find all the details on my website, livelabelfree.com. Um, and I'm sure you'll leave the links in the show notes as well. Um, I have my own podcast, the Live Label Free podcast. Um, my book, Rainbow Girl, which is my memoir about autism and and my story um, growing up undiagnosed autistic, how I developed an eating disorder and, and really a deep dive into everything, what it took for me to fully recover and become label free. Um, you can read all about that in Rainbow Girl. Um, but yeah, you can, if you go to my website, livelabelfree.com, you'll find everything there. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Lithia, you are absolutely incredible. What an absolute honor it's been to have this conversation you. with you. Thank you. Wow. I received that from you, Victoria. Thank you. Good, you're welcome. And if the, if my listeners have any questions for you, can they just shoot you a DM, contact yes. you? Yes, I'm I'm on Instagram. I, I didn't even mention that because I've been way skimping on Instagram. Um, mm-hmm. but uh that's live label free. It's it's all live label free. Um and they can also send me an email if they want, which is Livia at livelabelfree.com. I finally have an official email. <laughs> 
fabulous yeah. i'll link everything below for everyone's views. but thank you so much for your time and your wisdom yeah. it's been a pleasure so much thank you as well it's been an honor victoria good and to my queens watching and listening i will see you next week hope you enjoyed <laughs>